What's good, y'all? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Hope everybody's doing good, doing great. Um, today, we are joined by two people who are elite athletes in, the, in, their, in their sport. I mean, champions, putting up points, numbers on the board. Some are guaranteed bucket. Some will hold it down on defense and lead and go crazy. Today, I'm joined with two people. I'll get in a special two for here, but I'm joined with Spencer Dinwiddie from the Dallas Mavericks and Shaquille Barrett, aka Shaq Two. L, uh, left LB, I'm messing up on my things. So I'm so excited. Shaquille Barrett from the Tampa Bay Bucks. How y'all doing, man? I'm, I'm excited. Excuse the excitedness in my face and my voice. <laughs> no, I'm, hey, I'm good. Man. I'll go ahead. No, no, you first. You first. <laughs> All right. No, I'm good. I'm uh, happy to be on the show. Talk a little bit. Ask some nice questions. I just uh, appreciate you having me on. I'm excited, too. Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm happy to be here, obviously. Um, I see uh, Shaq, too, rocking the uh, the Mavericks gear, so we're already brothers. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I love it. I love it. Now, we talk, you know, I, you know, I know you see him in the Mavericks, Mavericks shirt, jersey, or the sleeveless material there. I don't know what to call it. But um, y'all actually have a lot in common uh, from a foundational standpoint, too. Uh, I want to start here from both of you, because one thing that you both have in common is your actual college careers. You spent a good portion of them actually out where I'm at in Colorado. Uh, Shaq, you went to CSU for football. Uh, Spencer, you went to CU for basketball. Could y'all both kind of talk to me about um, those experiences during that time and also kind of how it felt to leap into the league from your, in your respective careers from there? Whoever wants to go first, too. Uh, we can keep, keep it with Shaq going first. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, I, I like uh, my time at Colorado State. It was very enjoyable. It was uh, different, a lot different than uh, making that jump to the NFL in that league because it is going from the Mountain West to the NFL is difficult. But like SEC schools, it might be a little bit easier. It's going to be difficult for girls. But if I was able to like have a benefit of being at like more of a Big name school would have probably been a little bit easier of a transition, but uh, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I had some great coaches. They instilled a lot of good values that I would need and uh, help my jumping transition to the league a little bit easier, even though it was hard regardless because I went undrafted. So I was facing uphill bell battle uh, initially. So, it, I mean, Colorado, Fort Collins, I mean, we I love Fort Collins a lot. We – we ain't mess with Boulder that much like that, <laughs> but uh, no, I love Fort Collins a lot. And I did uh, catch, I, I caught you at a game too when you came to the uh, McGraw. I saw you all that. I, looked, I thought you were like, man, you like an old school player. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, so so for me, you know, uh, with Colorado and being in the Pac-12, I would say that, you know, at the time that I was in school back in, uh, you know, 2011, um, the Pac-12 had like the most pros coming out. So, you know, it was it was a good transition in terms of style of play and things like that. And, you know, we weren't a blue blood like a Duke or Kentucky or or UCLA or something like that. But I'm saying at the same time, we were in a conference that that produced a lot of pros. So I think it helped there. Um, you know, like Shaq said, like we didn't we didn't really rock with uh, CSU too much at all. So, you know, I no no love lost for uh, the, the, the wins that we got against CSU. But, um, you know, in general, I would say like play style conference uh, coaching staff definitely helped make the transition. And, and I think uh, like Shaq, I also kind of had a little bit of a, a difficult stretch in, in my career uh, just from the standpoint of being a second round pick. Um, and so in the NBA, obviously, there's only two rounds. So, you know, if you're in the second round, like nothing's uh, guaranteed. You got to really kind of fight uphill. So, you know, I, I definitely understand that that battle as well. And I want to touch on that, too, because I think. A lot of people see where y'all are at now. Like I said, elite players, like go-to players on teams, key move makers. But I think sometimes people don't understand the journey that it took for you to get to this point. Um, I know you mentioned it kind of earlier, but from my understanding, I know Shaq, Sha you were with the Broncos. Um, I know it was uphill battle as well with them and working with them, kind of getting to your spot, also proving yourself. Because you, like in, your, in y'all's mind, both, you know what you're capable of. You know that you can get a bucket. You know that you can have an impact on the quarter, on the field. But then you also know that you're going up against some of the best now that you're in this league. And it's just a different kind of showcase, a different level of like greatness that you have to get to. Cause I know Spencer, I think it was with like the Pistons and the Bulls and the G League kind of as well as you kind of fought through those rankings. Yeah. I would love for y'all to speak to that journey in the sense of 
like the mental and physical growth that kind of has to happen and occur for you to really be able to be at this point in your career today? All right. So, uh, you know, initially coming out, I'm, uh, I'm thinking I, I sort of be a first round pick. I think I'm top 10, top five, top two, not two, but, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it was real tough, man. Uh, had a season that I had for my senior year and then not get drafted, get overlooked like that. And go that route that I was going the undrafted, uh, route. But it also, in hindsight, looking back at it, it, was also the best route for me to take because having not – like, I was been working hard regardless, but not having to work as hard as I would have to as an undrafted uh, free agent compared to a top draft because as a top draft, they're going to give you every chance to succeed. And as undrafted, you got to find that opportunity. You got to create that chance for yourself. So that first year of me for me on practice squad was real big for me, man. I was able to gain some confidence, go against the uh, starting offensive tackles every day in practice, just get my feel for the NFL game and the speed I was able to learn from uh, Vaughn, Beware my first year. So it, it was a good experience for me in hindsight. I don't think I need, should have been undrafted, but I think <laughs> going that route helped me out a lot and helped benefit and uh, propel me to where I'm at right now in my career. I love that. It's like, what, it's like what J. Cole said, it's beauty in the struggle. Every time we, we think about where we should have been, it's like if, if, I, if I didn't do that, where, where would I be today? Would it be exactly. different? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's perfect. Yeah, I mean, honestly, he kind of took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, um, I, I left school my junior year. Um, I was projected to be a first-round pick, possibly even top 10 with, like, good workouts. And I tore my ACL um, and still declared anyway. Uh, so I kind of knew I was going to – be down in the draft and but I was kind of ready for the challenge um the funny thing is obviously nobody in my in my family had ever been to the NBA so we didn't know exactly what challenge it was we just thought okay if you're the best basketball player like you'll find your way onto the court and you know all that other stuff but I didn't understand the business of basketball and so in a lot of ways I was kind of a practice squad guy being that second round pick um you know going against the starters every day and, and that's how I also got confidence too you know, we would play one on one and we'd do different things. And, you know, when you win consistently, you you gain a confidence and, and it doesn't mean that you're going to play. Right. And so then there's a whole like uh, a curve of starting to treat this sport that has just been a, a, a game like a job. You know what I mean? And understanding like the extra film sessions, how to, you know, carry yourself, what time you got to be at the gym, like all of the stuff. And and just the almost like militant nature that if you approach the NBA and basketball with um, will help you succeed. And just really, like I said, treating it like a job and, and gaining confidence in, in small areas, but also not uh, necessarily being overbearing with how you uh, choose to kind of show that confidence and, and keep your head down and, and, and keep firing. I love it for sure. I can definitely see that now. I want to ask some off the field, off the court question, but I have to ask this too. For both of you in your respective fields, what's the most fun matchup that y'all look forward to during the season? It could be a team or it could be individual, but what's y'all's most like, almost like circled on the calendar kind of matchup? <laughs> hey, so uh, mine going into this upcoming year, I can't wait to play San Fran because they beat us real bad uh, this year and I ain't playing. I couldn't do nothing about it. I can't wait to play the Cowboys again because they put us out. I don't even know if we're going to play them again next year, but I can't wait to hopefully get them in the playoffs or something. And then uh, anybody who got, like, for to be a top team in the league, I always look forward to the Chiefs. I always look forward to the Ravens because, you know, there's always going to be the question. You got to beat the best to be the best, and I always want that uh, challenge. Yeah, I love that. I love that. What about you, Spence? Uh, same type of thing. Like, I don't really have any personal beasts in the league, so it's not uh, anything like that. I used to uh, really go at uh, Detroit because I feel like they kind of did me wrong. Um, but that was a that was a long long time ago. I, I got drafted in 2014, so that 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 was kind of uh in the past. Um, my time with the Nets was great, so you know I don't really have nothing there. I still got friends over there like Joe Harris stuff like that. I'm obviously always playing a top team, and also I would say uh playing the Lakers just because like I grew up um as a fan, and then also uh and, and I mean the Lakers in LA. Uh, when you play the Lakers at home, like, like it's cool and all, but when you play in L.A. and in Staples Center, you know, I'm going to have 30, 40, 50 family members, like, you know, hometown kid, all that stuff. So I would say, like, 
that that game is always circled. And then anytime you're going to play like a, a top team, you really get to test yourself is is circled for sure. I love that. See, now when I when I get into these seasons, I'm going to see these matchups and be like, I'm going to watch this game. I, I know. I know what's going on. Oh, hey, listen, two two big dunks. I think I ended up on Sports Center uh, when we played in the Staples. So it, it was solid with the win, of course. Of course, right? <laughs> Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had to beat them boys, man. That's yeah. my brother team. <laughs> That's too funny. Now, Spence, one thing you mentioned is uh, hometown. When you're talking about, you know, when you play in L.A., the family showing up. But I think speaking to that, I think as we talk about the things that y'all do on the court or on the field, um, I think it's definitely what's just as important is the work that y'all do off the field and off the court. Um, and with Community Voices, we'll make sure that we're going to be continuing our mission. I will be donating 5K to the 5050 Foundation and 5K to the Dinwiddie Family Foundation as well to continue the missions and efforts. Um, just for those who are uh, not as familiar with, with the foundations or want to also get involved, I just want to go ahead and fill you all in on what those missions are from each foundation. For the Dinwiddie Family Foundation, it's about empowering disadvantaged youth and at-risk youth, uh, making sure they empower them through fitness, literacy, and educational programming. And for the 5050 Foundation, it's about seeking to fill children's hearts back full by serving children who are in the foster care community. Two things I think align very well and are just equally as important um, for the future and for the kids. Um, I would love for you kind of both individually speak to your charities and uh, charities of choice and also what their specific missions mean to you personally. So originally my wife, she uh, like, couple nights, she just been on her phone, going through her phone, like writing all these notes and making this whole presentation on her phone. And then she so showed it to me and I'm looking like, I was blown away. I was a star. I'm like, hey, sweetheart, you was doing all this? Like, then it like, like just reading it cause she's a foster kid. So that's mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why I was near and dear to her. And for me, I'm a person who I grew up, had a, I'm pretty sure everybody had a tough childhood, but I have a tough childhood. And I just don't like when kids have to go through stuff that kids shouldn't have to go through. I just want kids to worry about being kids. They don't need to have to grow up faster than they should have to. So just like me, I just have a love for kids. So I just want to like do anything I can to help kids uh, be a kid. Cause yeah, it's, it's tough when you got to be a kid worrying about stuff that your parents should be worrying about yeah. and stuff like that. Like, yeah. yeah, that it sucks. So any anytime we can help kids, I'm down. I love it. What about you? Time. Um, for me, like you said, it's a, a charity designed to help disadvantaged youth through literacy and sports programming. Um, pretty much the, the way like the ethos kind of got embedded into me was like my family had a scholarship fund um, in our local church. Um, small, small scholarship fund, you know, I think it was $250 that it would uh, grant to kids going to uh, community colleges and then $500 I think it was granting to kids that would go to uh you know, four-year universities. Um, obviously, you know, we, we help within our means, of course, um, but when obviously I made it to the NBA and I could take it kind of to the next level and, and, and knew it was something that could carry on my grandma's legacy, who was, you know, one of my favorite people, you know, in my entire life. Actually, besides my son, prior to my son, she was my favorite person. Um, and, and that was some, that was a piece of her legacy at our, at our local church. So when uh, I could take the scholarship fund to the next level and start offering, you know, four-year gap scholarships so, you know, people could, you know, graduate college without student debt um, amongst some of our other smaller activations. Um, it, it was something that it was it was a no-brainer and something that I'm very proud of uh, that, that we've done. I love that because, I mean, like I said, both are just so important. I mean, we talk about student debt. I mean, people are still, like, wanting that student debt to be paid off or to be, like, canceled and things like that. Like, that's a yeah. really big debt that a lot of college students fight for in their life, like, to get a career and to get into things and then they leave with like so much kind of like weight on their shoulders. So those kind of things are so important, especially with like final literacy, financial literacy and those things. Then on top of that, like foster care too, I think people sometimes forget like the experiences that these children have to, that these children sometimes go through just to get to foster care. And then they experience on top of being mm -hmm. in the foster care system. Like it's, it's a whole process to definitely change a, a kid's life. So I love that y'all are working on those two things because they're just so important. They deserve attention and to be poured into so much. Um, now, I would love yes, to. Know this, I would love to know this too because having come so far in both y'all's careers, I know you talked about you know growing up um, 
that the, the foundation that you had in the beginning, seeing them like make grants for university kids, community college, uh, for kids going to universities and community colleges. Over time in y'all's career, how have y'all kind of, um, how has y'all's view on community building and that passion for it changed over the years, um, just from growing and having that platform get bigger from when you started to now? So with my, <clears throat> It, it, it's been growing like exponentially in like the last year or two because we originally started it up the COVID year and you know that slowed everything down there wasn't too many opportunities to get in front of anybody or actually host or do anything event wise so that uh slowed it down but I had uh two two great people helping me out my uh former lady was Melissa she used to help me out a lot now I got Mike helping me out a lot so they they most definitely helping us uh get in front of people get like there's a lot of people who want to extend and lend a helping hand to uh, our foundation because of the cause, because of what we're trying to do, and because of the mission that we uh, that we have and trying to excel at. So it's been it's been good and amazing to see the outpouring of support for our organization from everybody who it seemed like everybody might reach out to if they want to like help out and do anything they can to help us out with an event or pro providing some type of. Uh, supplies or support for something. So it's been, it's been real nice. And it's been growing a lot over like the last year into a year or two. I love it. I love it. What about you, Spencer? Um, I mean, same story. Obviously Mike is uh, who, who's got me on here as well. And, and he's been an integral part of, of growing our foundation as well. Um, and then obviously as my career has grown, so, so has like just the social profile, but then also my means to be able to kind of, you know, help out and, and do things. And so, you know, as, all that expands. Also, I think your mentality expands too, because because of the foundation that my grandmother, and my parents kind of like instilled in me. Um, now that I have the ability to do more, and we have the ability to not just uh, not just like out of pocket, right, but but reach more people and, and touch more people. Um, you you're inspired to do more. So that's how I think it's also grown um, over over my career as well. Um, and, and your focus can kind of shift when when you're not. Uh, in that survival mode, right? Like yeah. as, as a second round dude or a practice squad dude, sometimes you start off in survival mode, then you you grow and you get to your sixth, seventh year or wherever it is in the league and you get to this place where, you know, you can really start to kind of like pick your head up and and look around and see how you can help people. Mm, I love that, I love that. I really love that, especially that survival mode piece too. Like I think we're just, we're, uh, we're uh, born into <laughs> Exactly. So that's yeah, super no matter what you're doing on the team, you don't feel safe until like you like you get your next your contract yeah. after that. Like like, like yeah, I could I could be a little safe now. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Now I want to get into a more serious note. And I want to get into a more serious note. I think this with, with what's going on, I know that we always try to keep things light and fun, but I think community voices is based on the mission and having those important conversations around social justice and things. And I'm I'm pretty sure most people are aware. I know that we're all aware here as well um, on the recent senseless acts of police brutality um, in Memphis that took the life of Tyree Nichols, um, which is extremely unfortunate. I know a lot of us still kind of have a heavy heart and it's just still sitting with us as we maneuver through our day to day. But I think, you know, we're also heading into Black History Month. I mean, Black History Month, February 1st, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of, of a tougher start with this kind of news. Um, I think one thing that this reminds me of is that it's a reminder that we have to continue to carry on the legacy of those people that made Black History before us and the reason why we celebrate Black History Month. And not just the work that they've done, but also the generational hope that they gave us. I think in this world, there's oftentimes we wanna, yeah, we wanna, but sometimes it just feels hopeless. Like, what can we do? What change can we make no matter what I do? What am I like changing? But there is, it is really important to have that hope. Sometimes that's all we have is that generational hope. And, you know, we look at it like Mark, of course, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, even, you know, people that I look to for inspiration oftentimes, Fred Hampton, Huey Newton. Um, with all these leaders that came before us that kind of give us that strength and that hope, how do you two keep that hope for yourselves and uplift those around you continuously outside of your foundational programs as well? So initially, after you see... Well, uh, yeah, prayers must definitely go out to the family, the Nichols family, because that is it's tragic, man. And it, it just sucks because it's not like it's continuing to happen, no matter like what we're doing, no matter like what's going on, body cams or like everything, people video, video, like it's still going on. And 
I did like fall victim to feeling like, man, I'm hopeless, man. I like, like, like another one. Like, shh, come on, not again. It can't be happening again. But I did realize that, like, I can't. Like, we gotta like keep. We gotta just keep keep, keep the gas on the uh, pedal, man. I mean, I'll put on the gas because if like we stop fighting, then then what's gonna happen? Like, it's only gonna get worse because we fight now and then it still ain't changing. Like, they trying to seem like they changing a little bit, but. It's like, it's going to take a long time. I know when we say Ron wasn't built in a day, but we just got to just keep going forward. And I don't know the best way to do it. I don't know what to do, but we just got to keep moving forward as a people. And hopefully we'll, uh, hopefully we'll stumble upon the right outcome governmentally that will help us be better, better country. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I mean, for me, when I, when I look at these situations, um, and I think back to leaders, like you said, um, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, obviously Black History Month. Um, I think for me, it, it hit a little different um, in the last four and a half years or so, once my son was born. Mm. And you you think about the future that you hope for him to have. Um, and, and to Shaq's point, I think my biggest inspiration for fighting, obviously now, uh, revolves around that, right? Like, how can I do my part to try to create the best possible future for, for my son that he has a world that, you know, is, is better than the one that, that I'm in the same way my dad fought for, for me to have a better one than he was in. I think that legacy piece and that, that paying it forward piece is uh, what inspires me. Right. Um, when I am feeling hopeless in, in a, in, in a senseless act uh, like we just witnessed. For sure. For sure. And I, and I appreciate y'all. Expanding on that too, because I know it could be a heavy subject, but I want to say I appreciate y'all expanding on that. Um, but I had to mention because I said I know and you said you felt victim, but I, I wouldn't even say victim, but I think that is just a feel that's a human feeling. It's it's human to feel your emotions, to feel sad, to cry, whatever it is, it's like a human emotion to allow yourself to feel something that doesn't come up at another time and 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 rear rear its head ugly in a ways. But I, I love that y'all speak to that because I think these things happen, and I think the first thing they do is kill your hope. And I think that's in a way what they're like, like the evil objective is, is to kill our hope. So like, we don't have nothing to fight for. What are we doing? We're just here. We're just that. But I think, like you said, if we can continue to keep that hope and just even the things that we do in our community, like those things are going to help continue leading the generation that comes after us to continue fighting that fight. Because if we don't have no hope, then what is what, what are our kids going to have? What, are, what exactly. is our generation going to have? That is going to be you know what I'm saying lost, so, not even soldiers at that point. They're just gonna feel weak. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to fight for. So, um, I love the speech that and anybody listening as well who's feeling that. Just remember to feel how you feel. Take those feelings in, sit with them, but make sure to keep some kind of hope because that that's the only way that this fight continues to go, and that's the only way we're really gonna make things change is to continue to hope like the ones that came before. So I appreciate y'all speaking on that. Um, as we ready to wrap things up, I know y'all also busy. Um, I want to ask one more question. Um, I think when we think of Black history, too, we think of, like, the big things. And I mentioned some of the big civil rights leaders. But I oftentimes don't think that we talk about the local history, like the local, like, impact of things that people do. You know what I mean? Coming from a certain space or, like, you know, y'all came from CSU and you came from CU. That's history within itself to see yourself go to the league. Like, people in your family haven't seen that. That's, like, Black history within itself, whether it be on a – you know, museum level or like a community, family, friends level, things that people talk about all the time. I would love to know in a way, because I think we all kind of have our own history that we want to set and things that we want to do in our career to kind of leave our footprints on this earth as we can. I would love to know for y'all individually, how do you kind of plan to create your own history and um, throughout your career and like your community efforts? So uh, like professionally, like from my uh, career, I just want to go out there every game, leave it all out on the field. I want to affect the, every game so everybody who watched know that Shaquille Bear played in that game. And then, like, in the community, I think uh, starting off with our 50-50 foundation, that's a good way to leave a, right, a legacy for – it. like, so, like, especially with Southern Earth, like, yeah, if I use my kids, that's my inspiration. It's going to be hard to lose hope because I, I want them to live in a great world, man. And I do want to leave it better than the way we found it. But – uh. Yeah, I think I could leave a legacy like that with that foundation and let my kids, they have the hard for it, take over for it and just keep it going for as long as we can. And uh, just help as many families, kids, like like everyone, as many people as possible, because 
the more people you reach and you actually reach and they actually listen and actually help, like that's like changing the world. No matter how many it is, as long as if it's like there's anybody that start start to change the world. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Mike Spence. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me in terms of how I want to make history and, and my legacy, I think, you know, I touched on the the off the court piece, right? Like my 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 grandmother's parents, sorry, were the first black people to to be in the I, the small church that I talked to you about um, earlier. Then my grandmother, you know, helped start the scholarship from carrying on that legacy, doing good works in the communities uh, or in in our community, um, and, and really feeling uh, uh, empowered by that, and also just just proud of like continuing on my family's work. Um, and then also I would say in terms of my career, I would just want to be a beacon for people that um, have, have faced adversity and come through it on the other side. You know what I mean? I would say at every point in time that, you know, I was supposed to hit it big or be on the other side of something, like I, I, I hit a rock. You know what I mean? Like when I was supposed to, like I said, when I was supposed to be a first round pick, I told my ACL. When I was supposed to sign for a hundred million, I told my ACL again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. So, you know, I, I got hit with stuff in a lot of different ways. Um, and I've always taken the unconventional route and kept my head down, kept working hard, kept firing. You know what I mean? Like when, when it was time to pick a college, I chose Colorado over Harvard. A lot of the blue bloods didn't want me. Um, a lot of my family wanted me to go the academic route, safe six figure job for 30, 40 years, whatever. And I said, I'm going to the league. I mean, I already told you about my injuries and stuff like that, but just understanding that, you know, adversity and coming out on the other side of it, not only makes you a better basketball player, but makes you a better man. Uh, man or woman, obviously, um, and and that that life is only going to throw at you stuff that you can handle. Mm. You know what I mean? Even even when it's even when it's crazy, even when you're a 20 year old kid, you think your NBA dream gone, like it ain't gone. You know what I mean? Like you you got you still have a chance. You're just gonna have to approach it a little different and, and make it happen. I love that. I love that. And I, so yeah, I amen to that. <laughs> exactly. No, for real, a thousand percent, mm-hmm. a thousand percent. Because I, I wanna. Like I said, I want to, again, say I appreciate y'all's time. I know we're getting ready to wrap things up. I, I want to leave it on one note, too. Like I said, it's so important to hear y'all's stories and different backgrounds and where you come from, what made y'all who you are today, the mind state, just the grind, coming overcoming adversity. And um, anybody listening, just remember, like I said, I mentioned the hope piece, but these stories, right? I'm not going to be a, a – I'm not going to be an elite football player. You know what I'm saying? Like, Shaq, I, I cannot – to this day, I cannot get a bucket or even handle the ball <laughs> at all. I'm a mess on the, I love playing it, but I'm a mess on the court. I'm gonna stick to my little 24 hour fitness, whatever. But listen, the point is I can still gain inspiration from their story. We all go through these stories. We all go through these journeys because these stories are lessons for the people who are after us. Everybody's always watching, whether it be your son, whether it be your daughter, whether it be somebody in the stands. They're watching you. They're watching what you do. And a piece of your story, a piece of what you do can save somebody's life. It can change somebody's life. I mean, you don't know what those seeds that we plant every day with the people that we meet and things that we go through will do. So just remember, even when things feel hopeless and you feel like the world's all against you, feel that. But our stories, people are watching. Somebody's watching watching us. So it's about how do we continue to progress? How do we continue to change that one person's lives by changing our lives and continue that cycle, that progressive process? So I just want to make sure I ended that with this because I know times are heavy. And I, once again, I appreciate y'all's time. I'm looking forward to getting to y'all's season. Spencer, I'm already, well, I'm, I'm already watching you drop <laughs> every game going crazy. Like, mm-hmm. I, Thank I, you, man. <laughs> I appreciate Thanks, y'all. Uh, do y'all have any last words or anything, too, before we get ready to wrap things up? Uh, <laughs> no, I just appreciate you having me on. And like you know, Spencer said it all, man, about the adversity is the way you react to that, John, and just keep fighting through, even when it do seem hopeless, seem like your dream gone. If you still believe it's there, just keep fighting. It's going, it's going to be a will. It's a way that's going to happen. And uh, good luck to you, Spencer, the rest of the year, man. Y'all boys keep holding it down for me, man. Man, man I got you. <laughs> I got you. Hey, and good luck in the offseason and everything going forward. And, and shoot, I hope that you're in the Super Bowl playing – you know, and, and doing your thing. Yes, man. sir. Appreciate another it. Another one, too. Another one. You know, we we know you got one. It's time for you to get a. Get yeah, another one. you know, I mean? gotta do it again. I love it. I love it. Yeah, Thank I you for tuning in to another episode of Community Voices. Until next time, take care.